country In every nation From many tribes In all of creation Someone is kneeling, someone is dancing, someone is worshiping you. Someone is kneeling, someone is dancing, someone is worshiping you. Ocean to ocean, from mountain to mountain, in the dance of the children, in the voice of thousands. Jesus, someone is. Someone is shouting, someone is worshiping you. Someone is bowing, someone is shouting, someone is worshiping you. And it's you, and you love in many tongue confession. Heart of the orphan, the raised hands of the lame. You can listen in the cry of the outcast on the lips of the shamed. Jesus, someone is weeping, someone is blessing. Someone is worshiping you. Someone is weeping. Someone is blessing. And the last Alpha and Omega, the Lamb of God, the Rock of Ages, is the Holy One of Israel. It's the Great King. It's the Gentle Shepherd. It's the Mighty, Mighty, Mighty. 
sovereign I am Sing it Your name You are the pure You are the pure spotless lamb Your name is holy
<laughs> yes, Lord, yes, Lord. Mm. Thank you, Jesus. He gets excited about the sight of water. 
So if we see if we can hear you sing Fill me up, Lord I don't have to feel it I just want more of your Holy Spirit I'm tired of whispering I'm tired I'll start to shout Before we go in any different direction, let me remind you why we are here. I believe I'm speaking for everyone out there, but let me just say why we are here, the platform. It's not to have another service. It's not to entertain somebody. It's not because we knew that crowds of people would be coming, so we better open the doors. It's not because we have nothing else to do. And it's not because we're trying to make money, because holding meetings actually loses money. The reason we're here is because we want to meet with God. The reason you're here is because you want to meet with God. And I come into the meeting tonight with fresh anticipation, wondering what's God going to do tonight? What's God going to say tonight? I think every one of us who've, who've had the privilege of being involved in the revival for a number of years have had something hit us at a given service, at a given time, where, where we just said, we can't have another service. There's got to be visitation. This is in the midst of ongoing visitation. This thing's exploded. There's got to be more visitation. Lord, this is wonderful, but it's got to go beyond. We've said that the purpose of revival is to get us back to normal. Now that we're getting closer to normal, we can see what it really looks like. We can't let up now. We can't back down now. You know, j just picture somebody climbing Mount Everest and coming back down and saying, man, that was easy. <laughs> I don't know how so many people died going up there. That was easy. Someone else says, buddy, you stopped at the first peak on the way up. You didn't see Mount Everest. And that's the way some of us are with revival visitation. We get in the groove, God starts moving, then we just want to have nice services. And if we can be packaged right, we could actually be deceived into thinking God is still moving when he's long since moved somewhere else. We don't want to package anything. We want God to come down. 
I just, I want you to do this. If we just stop worship here for a bit and, and get ready for the word, or if we go back into worship, whichever way, that's perfectly fine. And pastor just had to go to, to visit someone in the hospital. who's was just hit by a car. We're going to pray for a dear brother in a moment. But before we do anything else, would you just lift your hands to God and express in your own words your love for him or your hunger for him or your desire for him? Great God, we love you. We want you. We're so hungry and thirsty for you. We long for you, God. Our soul is bursting with desire for you, God. Oh, Father, we look at this dying world and we say, stretch out your hand. We look at a divided church and we say, stretch out your hand. We look at sick and hurting people, we say, stretch out your hand. We look, God, at the bankruptcy of our own lives at times and we say, God, stretch out your hand. Tonight, Lord, come and visit us. Tonight, come and visit us. Jesus. We're going to pray for someone. I wonder, though, if after we do that, we could sing another song. Take me away. That one. There's a brother that's been a real blessing to the revival for some years, helping house people that come here and helping with folks standing online at certain times of the year. Anyway, he was, he was hit by a car, and in the natural, it's, it's very serious. I think of Psalm 107.20, it says in Hebrew, what the Lord did for the children of Israel, he sent his word, and he healed them. Let's ask God right now to send his word to that hospital and to work a miracle. Father, reach out your hand. Work a miracle. Lord, you did not send this car accident. This is not a blessing from heaven. Lord, this is the work of man or the work of the thief. We ask you to intervene and to intercept everything meant for death or permanent disability. And right now, turn it. Bring a healing now. Bring healing now. Bring healing now. Touch him. Heal him. Raise him up with no side effects, no damage, no lasting consequences that he can run his race for many years to come. And Lord, we give you, we give you this night in absolute terms. If it means we're here until four in the morning on our faces, if it means, Lord, we go home and, and are on our faces seeking you, if it means we go out of here in an hour and start witnessing, Lord, whatever it means, if it means deep upheaval and repentance in our own lives, if it means a whole new direction, whatever it means, come, Lord. Come, Lord. And touch us and change us. Jesus. I am looking for I am longing for the place Where I can lay my head Upon your breast And I am looking for The place where you will pour your oil over me all over me Born over me Born over me You're all A perfect being Born over me, Holy Spirit
time as a prayer but but break out of the mode of just singing and break out of the mode of just saying words you can be quiet you can be screaming that's not the issue but let your heart explode with hunger for God friends whatever country you're from if you're from America if you're from another country there's only one hope that is visitation from heaven. Yes. It is God stretching out his hand and doing more than he has ever done in a shorter period of time than he's ever done it. And we can be the recipients and the participants in the greatest visitation this earth has seen. God's looking for willing hearts. He's looking for hungry hearts. He's looking for desperate hearts. So Lendl's going to lead us in this one more time. And then let the cry come that your voice alone would pierce the heavens and open them up. That God would come down in his glory.
Send fire. Send fire. Strong holes. As we're in the presence of God, there's just one specific thing that's on my heart that we need to pray for. Sometimes the Lord will just draw our attention to a certain country. It could be because we have a lot of visitors from that country or God's just laying that on our hearts. A few months ago, week in, week out, we were praying for Germany, 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 Germany. We were having a first year class at the School of Ministry, five, six hundred people present. And we had some guests there from Germany that are holding a major event with some of the revival team later this year. And, and I said, let's just pray for Germany. We began to pray, had a good time in prayer. We stopped and were ready to go on to teach. And suddenly intercession just broke out. Some of you were there just wailing and crying out. Some of the German students around this couple. And the thing just broke out. And I, I got a letter from, from Jobst in Charlotte, from the couple in Germany. And they said, they'll never forget that time that we prayed together. I'll never forget the way the students prayed and the way God came down, but they said since they've been back, there's been a wave of intercession spreading across the country. Something's happened. And, and I'm sure, I'm sure that the week in, week out, crying out to God for Germany did at least something towards helping that happen. And, and my heart just keeps being stirred today, yesterday, as we've had a number of visitors in from Japan. And I wonder if we could just take a moment. If you'd all just stand again, we're going to be getting into the Word soon. You'll be able to sit. But if all of our Japanese guests, if you're from Japan, if you're a student in the school, if you're just a visitor, if you just come up on the platform quickly from Japan, okay, I don't know if all of you are here, but if you are here from Japan, just come on up and we want to pray. We want to pray for heaven to be open. We want to pray for breakthroughs in Japan. Jesus. 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 I'm going to ask Lendl to sing this through one more time. And after he does, I'm going to give the microphone to one of our Japanese students. I want you to pray just in Japanese. God will hear your voice. And we're going to cry out for visitation. Here, here's a nation that's had the gospel for a long time. And only a tiny percentage of the people are born again. Most churches in Japan are 30 or 50 people. But God's doing something. Some of us have had the joy of going over there and seeing there's something sparking, something sparking, something sparking. I believe it's the will of God that as we're in a mode of intercession and worship that we lift this up. So lend the lead us through one time. And as we begin to cry out, we want the fire to fall in Japan. Revival fires. If God did it in Korea and South Korea, he can do it in Japan. If God's been doing it in China, he can do it in Japan. So let's lift this up to the Lord. Jesus, 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 we call it out to you, Lord Jesus.
Wherever you live, I want you to just raise that to the Lord right now. Or if it's your church that's the foremost thing on your mind, or your denomination, just lift that up to the Lord. Speak it to His ear, that He'll hear, that He'll move heaven and earth, and that He'll visit your city, your town, your church. Hear us. Open up the heavens. Hear us for our cities. Hear us for our land. Hear us for the church. been said revival is not our church is being filled with people but the people in our church is being filled with God if we can be filled with God friend anything can happen Jesus 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 the heavens Lord Jesus Jesus. Jesus. 
God is near to the brokenhearted. Just feel we need to take this one step further. If, if you're bursting with a burden to see revival come where you are, I mean, you're bursting to see revival come. Just gather around this altar real quick and lift up a request to God. I mean, God responds to broken hearts. Just get up as close as you can and the moment you get where you are, begin to pour your heart out. Forget anybody's around you. Make your case to God. Touch heaven. Touch heaven. He's near to the brokenhearted. Get up as close as you can. Jesus. Let's 
fire, let the fire fall. Open up the heavens. Open up the heavens. Open up the heavens. Open up the heavens. Give yourself over to the Lord completely. Lord, my life, my life for your work, my life for revival, my life for souls, my life for your glory, Lord, whatever it means, just offer yourself up to Him. We've offered our praise and our prayers and our finances. Just offer yourself up to God. Jesus.
Jesus. Jesus. Jesus. written in the word ask of me and I'll give you the nations as your inheritance it's a word from the father to the son it's written that there's going to be a glorious church without spot or wrinkle blemish or any such thing it's written that Jesus will build this church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it there will be a multitude that no one could number from every tongue and tribe and kindred and nation would you lead us in prayer for the nations John Whatever else is on your heart to pray is. I want you to realize that the earth is ripe. It's ripe. When things ripen, sometimes they ripen above ground and it's very obvious. But some things ripen underground like potatoes and other things. But the world is ripe. Things are ready to be plucked. Things are ready to be shaken loose. Things are ready to be dug up in the spirit. It's ready and we're the harvesters. Father, we pray God for the harvesting of the nations. Lord, we pray, Father, that every plump fruit Lord God, every different type, Lord God, of nation, tribe, tongue, Lord God, the hard places get dug up, and that the underground fruit and vegetables be pulled out, Lord, that your people, Father, come out from the ends of the earth, Lord, we pray, Father, that, Lord, the toughest places, Lord, the Middle East, Lord God, North Africa, Lord, India, Lord, China, once again for Japan, Lord, the Philippine Islands, Indonesia, Lord God, the jungles, oh God, Father, we pray that you would reap them, reap them, and send forth laborers, send forth laborers, thrust them out into the harvest, Lord, do what's needed to be done, shake us by the neck, kick us out, throw us out, burn us out, Lord God, put us in your bows and arrows, put us in your cannons, put us, Lord God, in your launch pads, but send out laborers into the Father's harvest. Father, we pray, Lord, that the ripe harvest would not be lost. Lord, don't let it become rotten fruit that the world just takes once again. Lord, we pray, Lord, as we go into, Lord, this millennium, 2,000 is it, Jesus. Jesus. Lord, people wonder whether it's the last days. Well, it's our last days. We'll never get another chance. God, help us to do the work of the kingdom in these last days. Lord, shake us out of everything that binds us. Break the strongholds. Throw off the weights and the sins. Lord God, set the captive free. Lord, release people into their callings, into your vision for their life. And Father, we pray, Lord, from this place and the nations in these represented in these places right here, Lord, among the, amongst the people here, Father, to those even not represented, the, the 280 nations out there, Father, we pray, Lord, that none should perish. None should perish. And Father, before this night is over, I pray that the call from heaven, Lord, not just to be free, but to be sent, be heard by many. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the liberating anointing of the Holy Ghost. Lord, that makes the difference for the name of Jesus, for the blood that, Lord, clobbers sin. And Father, for, Lord, the special place you have for everyone here. Lord, send us out. Use us this day. Lord, I thank you, Father, that the special nations, Lord, the bookends of World War II, Germany and Japan, Lord, have become the apple of your eye. And Lord, you've looked upon them, Father, and said, where sin abounded, grace is going to abound more. Thank you, Father, 
for, Lord, calling us to pray for these special people in these days. We honor your presence in Jesus' name. Shake my heart and form it. Take my mind, transform it. Take my will, conform it to yours, to yours, oh Lord. If you're able to stand up just before we change the order of things, let it be a fresh surrendering of your life to the will and the purpose of God. That whatever he's done in the past, however wonderful, that you want to see him do something even more in your life. And I believe just as John Cava, our, our school missions director, prayed, I had it in my heart before he prayed it. There are people here who have just heard a call from God. You've just been going a certain way and God said, no, this is where you're going. Or you may have known you're giving your life to ministry, but God's laid something very definite in your heart. And he may have told some of you a major sacrifice that has to come, but... If you've heard a word from the Lord or if something's just burst in your heart and you know, you know the way you're going to have to spend the rest of your life. You know what it's going to mean. If you've gotten a fresh call, then even as we worship him with the song, just lift your hands to him and say, Lord, here I am. I'm willing. And everyone else, whatever race you've been running, if your heart's set on him, here I am, Lord, I'm willing. Here I am. Take my heart and form my mind transform it take my will take my will conform it to to your take my heart say take my heart and form it take my One more time to your soul, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Go ahead, Bob. Why don't you just uh, quietly take your seats for the next part of the service? Jesus. Steve Hill expected to be here tonight, but he had a conflict in his schedule with a plane ticket, and so he had to leave earlier than he anticipated or wanted to. Is this all right? This is ringing. Is this because of my microphone? Praise God. Just a couple of quick announcements. Uh, the brother that we prayed for earlier who was hit by the car as a pedestrian, pastor just came back from the hospital and uh, he, his life is not in danger. But he is, praise God. But he's got broken bones and lots of pain. So as the Spirit puts him on your heart, continue to pray for him. He's a faithful worker in this revival and serves the people who come in. Uh, also, uh, we wanted to let you know, those of you who are, who are accepted to the School of Ministry but have not yet registered, uh, we look very carefully at our applicants and we pray and we take very seriously those that we put an accepted stamp on. So if you are accepted but have not yet registered because for one reason or another... We encourage you to go ahead and register on Monday. We will be taking registration. Uh, 
uh, registrants on Monday, so it's, it's not necessarily too late. If you have an acceptance to your application, then perhaps, you know, take that as seriously as we do. It could be God, God still speaking to you. Don't get so easily discouraged if that's your situation. Was there anything else I needed to mention? Was that it? Three, three persons in the Godhead? <laughs> what? Oh, yes, yes. And the third year students, the third year students at the Brownsville Revival School of Ministry, there is a payment plan, and that may not have been clear to you, and some of you may be holding back from registering because you're not ready to, uh, to put down the finances, but there is a payment plan, so be encouraged in that as well, third year students, all right? Uh, why don't you turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 24. Luke 24. Praise God for entrusting a people with His burden. When we're strongly led to pray a certain way like what just happened, we know we're in the Spirit, and then the burden of the Lord unfolds and there's deep intercession and weeping at whatever level it was. Friends, I want you to realize something, that the things that are dear to the heart of God, He shares with His people. We're not just living up to some formula and being called on and, and asked to pray. It is that, but it's more. God is sharing the things that matter to Him. See, He's not concerned what's on TV after the service tonight. He's not thinking already with His stomach, okay, what's ahead, let's get past this. The things dear to His heart are the nations, souls, the life and the glory, shoo, and the beauty of His church. And He's been searching for a people who would worship Him in spirit and truth. Because that's the kind of people He can trust with His secrets. A very sacred thing occurred on this ground tonight. God shared His heart. It's a good sign that God's waking His people up, that we would be concerned with the things of the kingdom. Fure! And not the things of this life. Amen? Hallelujah! On New Year's Eve, Pastor was going to ask some people to share what they felt was in the, the future of the church in this new millennium. Remember that? And we didn't get through that that night because that precious preacher from Tennessee unburdened the heart of God for us and there was a great move of the Spirit that night. And I think I was one of the first to order that tape and I want to share that. I already have some people in mind that I want to hear that was awesome. So you wanted to do that again on Sunday. You wanted some people to share what what they felt was in store for the future of the church. And, um, and the, the brothers on the platform had s such burden and vision that we didn't get to the, hear from the people in the congregation. But I was ready both nights. I thought for sure you'd call on me. <laughs> so, I thought I'd take a little opportunity tonight and lead into my message tonight with my two cents on that, if that's okay, Pastor. And there are two things that I think in my heart, that God has in store for His people, the church, this millennium. And I teach a class at the school called the Emerging Church, so these things are very precious to me, and God's called me to consider these things, and to pray about these things, and to preach and teach about these things. But at least two things. Well, I'll say three. I'll say this. The local church is going to enjoy a great strength, and will take the place of all parachurch Ministries. I'm not saying there won't be parachurch ministries, uh, you know, things outside the church, organizations, institutions, and whatever, you know, um, th whatever ministries are organized outside the local church. I'm not saying they won't exist, but I think a new strength is going to be found in the house of God where there are grandfathers and grandmothers and moms and dads, senior citizens, little children, adults, the, the body of Jesus Christ, the family of God is going to be raised up with a strength in the local setting that's going to be unheard of in history. Hallelujah. Anyway, that gets, that gets me excited. I'm a church man and uh, a nation's man, but God's running a family business. His great high priest and his apostle was his son. God's raising sons up in his house to serve him. We're not just slaves. We're also sons and daughters. Amen? And he trains up his sons and daughters and they do what he tells them to do because they share his burden. The second thing is this. I believe God is going to bring a radical and supernatural restoration of the five full ministry gifts in Ephesians chapter 4. 
apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. The church has been operating in the flesh, doing things with their own leadership organizations for too long. I'm not saying that God is angry at the organizations, but I am saying that that was not the complete intent of God and people who are gifted are going to replace the systems that we've put together. Now listen, these apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers, they are not going to be proud people. They're going to be broken people. They are not called, they are not called to wear special collars and get their name put in a magazine. They're going to be a faceless generation. God's in the process for, right now of raising up a, a young generation of prophets. And these are the ones going to be characterized by being broken to the things of this life. And be awakened to the things of God. And they're going to have the power to rally people to Jesus Christ. And finally, I see for the church of the new millennium, there will be a baptism in the Holy Spirit for the church in the last days that the church has yet to experience. I believe that local churches and individuals are going to walk in an immediate awareness of the presence of God. That no man or church has experienced to this day for those who are willing to pay the price. God is going to make it available because the world has yet to see the glory of the liberated sons and daughters of the resurrection. But God intends for His people to walk in a power that we don't quite understand and we're not quite ready for. If God answered our prayer through the song we sang tonight, Pastor, just before you came, open up the heavens and let your glory come, and He will answer it. But if He answered it in total tonight, we would not be able to contain it. If we were aware of the potential of this body believers right here tonight. The power and the authority and the understanding, the potential of the kingdom to reach this community and beyond, we wouldn't be able to handle it. We'd get, we'd get proud fast. But God's working on us. And He wants to clothe us with power. Hallelujah. I like that kind of talk. In Jesus' name. Look with me, if you would, in Luke's Gospel, chapter 24. Starting with verse 45. And why don't we go ahead and stand for the reading of the Word of God that created all things and redeems us. And then we'll pray together and you can be seated again after that. In verse 45 it begins that Jesus opened up the minds of the disciples to understand the Scriptures. Now, let me throw something in here right now, which I did plan. Jesus had just been raised from the dead. And it was probably, and still is probably, the very best kept secret on earth. When Jesus was raised from the dead, He turned the universe upside down. And all of the evil authorities that ruled the earth were submitted to the man, Christ Jesus. And He gave the authority of His kingdom its keys to his people. So there was a total transference of power. Time and eternity just shifted in the moment that Jesus woke up from his Sabbath rest. He was active in his spirit in the underworld, but his body was at rest. He was raised from the dead, and everything changed, and the people closest to him did not know it. They visited an empty tomb. Some of us today, though we are followers of Jesus like his first disciples were, we still don't quite get that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. We still visit the empty tomb. We still depend on the way we feel and we perceive things instead of just accepting by faith divine reality. The man is alive. And the reason why it's hard to grasp is because we're not used to the supernatural, which is supposed to be normal. Israel, from its most germinal state, when it was a seed, 
was called by God to be a supernatural people. And they never accepted that reality. There was only a remnant. It was the reality of the spirit that they rejected. And the church has fallen into the same rut. We still visit the empty tomb. The second reason why it's hard for us to grasp the reality of the resurrection is because it's hard for us to accept the death that becomes before the resurrection. See, the disciples had trouble grasping the reality that the Messiah had to suffer and die. That was opposite to their wisdom. Isn't that the way God works? Always the opposite to human wisdom. We have trouble with the same truth. We're not willing to pay and pray the price for what God wants to pour out on the earth. A revelation of His risen Son. But in this verse right here, Jesus opened up the minds of His disciples so that they were able to grasp the truth. Suffering, then glory. Suffering, then glory. First death to this world, then life to God's. You can't have both. The church has tried it, it does not work. Things have gotten worse, not better. First suffering to this life, and then joy in the morning. Amen? So with that revelation, in verse 46, Jesus said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day. And that repentance for forgiveness of sins, repentance for forgiveness of sins, would be proclaimed in His name to all the nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending forth the promise of my Father upon you. But you are to stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Father, we bow in your presence. Boldly before the throne of grace. Lord, that you would put a stirring in your people today. A fire that cannot be quenched. A revelation, Lord. A clothing with power. Lord, let this message not go forth in superior speech or the wisdom of men, but let it go forth in the demonstration of the Spirit and power. Lord, we pray, even if we're praying for something that we don't understand completely, let there be tonight a demonstration of the Spirit of God and a demonstration of the power of God, even as we've already enjoyed to this moment. Lord, I pray that even as the Word is spoken forth, that people will be healed so that Your Word will be confirmed. That demons will flee so that Your Word, Your great Gospel will be confirmed. That people will be set free in their minds and in their bodies to serve You uninhibited. May calls go forth even to the nations as this Word goes forth. Lord, bless the people You died for. And raise them up in your joy and power in Jesus' name. Amen. Glory to God. And you may be seated. Thank you, Jesus. Clothed with power is the name of this message. And I'm going to take it by looking at three different forms of clothing, so to speak, that we wear. I'll get to those in a minute, but I'm going to talk about wearing a veil like a bride, wearing armor like a soldier, and wearing a cross like a corpse. These are the things I know that the Lord has showed me tonight that we must wear in order to be clothed with power. But I want to just share with you a little bit something that's burning on my heart. I'm Pentecostal. I got saved in a Pentecostal church, and I belong to a denomination called the Assemblies of God. I love the people of this denomination. I'm gladly a part of their denomination. I thank God for their heritage. I thank God for their parenting to me and their training of me. This is an Assemblies of God church. Uh, God sent His revival to, to this 
uh, to a church in this denomination. The history, of course, is found in a, on Azusa Street, Los Angeles, at the turn of the century or thereabouts, 1906. And um, just about every and any Pentecostal denomination can find its roots, either directly or indirectly, to that move of God that, was, that, that burned long enough to, to work and send forth some missionaries and raise up a new work and a revelation, although it was also despised by many quarters. Well, be that as it may, I'm a Pentecostal. But the danger of organizing after a move of God, which must happen, and getting into a routine and getting used to what God has done and said is that we begin to domesticate the lively thing that God has done. We begin to put form to something that started in the beauty of a relationship and in a visitation of power. And I can remember when I was in a former district, a wonderful district, one of the best in, uh, I think one of the best in the, in the States, awesome place to serve in the Assemblies of God. Uh, it was in Wisconsin, and we were, we were being taught at one point or encouraged by one of our leaders, and rightly so. He was encouraging us ministers to maintain our Pentecostal distinctive. Maintain your Pentecostal distinctive. And I said, thank God he's saying that because we Pentecostals need to keep the reality of what the Spirit is doing in front of our people, in front of our leadership, you know, praying for the baptism. I mean, that's what gave birth to this movement and other movements. So let's pray for the baptism. Let's teach about it. Let's speak about it. Let's talk about other tongues. And I, I, I thought that was great, and I still think it's great, but after a while I started to think about that statement, and I thought, boy, as good as that statement was, it still reflects a problem. I mean, think of it like this. The weathermen of Florida, I'm talking about the news guys, they all gather together with a conspiracy to convince the people of Florida, which is where you are right now, those of you visiting, by the way, you're in northwestern Florida. They all get together because they want to convince us that a hurricane is coming. Or worse yet, they want to convince us we're in a hurricane. So they bombard us on the television, they bombard us through the radio with an urgent message, hurricane, 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 prepare yourselves, we are now in the middle of a hurricane. Clean your bathtubs, fill it with water, get your flashlights, your candles ready, board up your windows, stay clear of them, because we're in the middle of a hurricane. Hurricane, 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 hurricane. But friend, when we look outside, the birds are flying, and the sky is blue. I'm not a technician. I'm not a meteor meteorologist. I'm not a weatherman, nor the son of a weatherman. <laughs> but I think to know enough, by virtue of the nature of a hurricane, if you're in one, you know it. You don't have to maintain a hurricane distinctive. We're a lot better off with Pentecost than we are with a Pentecostal distinctive. If we have Pentecost, then we have power. We will have the distinctive ring of speaking in other tongues, indeed. But we'll also have the meat of the thing. The power to transform lives. The power to come into a nation called Japan in the liberty of the sons of God and bring change. It is God's intention that we be clothed with power. And it's going to happen. I'm not talking about the doctrine. I love the doctrine of the distinction of tongues as the marker of the Holy Spirit. I think it's good, and I think it's right, and I think it's accurate. But it's not as good as praying in tongues. And it's not as good as actually having power. The doctrine is a description, but it is not a definition. Power defines who we are. And it is God's intention 
that we be clothed with power in this final hour. There is no other way to cut through the mass of darkness that hovers over these nations. We can talk about it as long as the day is, but there's going to come a moment where our trouble is not going to be trying to get the power. Our trouble is going to be in the flesh when we're persecuted and having to deal with the power. We must be clothed with power. We must be clothed with a veil on our heads. That is, having the mentality of a bride. I'm not talking about the kind of veil that covers the heart of somebody who's in unbelief, that's taken away when we turn to the Lord according to 2 Corinthians 3. I'm talking about the veil on the head of a bride. The, the veil on the head of a bride identifies her with her bridegroom. So that we share the characteristics and the personality of the one to whom we belong. That's what the veil represents. It says, I belong to this one. The woman, as the bride of Christ, submits to her husband. So that they become partners in his work. He doesn't help her in her work. They become partners in the bridegroom's work. It's a family business. So Jesus, for instance, when he waited four days to go visit his friend Lazarus, he was sick, but then Lazarus died, and Jesus came there four days later. During those four days, Jesus was not preparing his funeral message. Jesus was not a funeral preacher. That wasn't his identity. That was not his identity. And he only acted like himself. So he came and he said, this is who I am. I am the resurrection and the life. So if I go to a funeral, I don't preach the funeral, I raise the dead. That's what I do. When the bride is wearing the veil of her master, she will operate with the same personality and identity. But we've been afraid to identify ourselves with the master. We have been reluctant to wear the veil. In 1 Corinthians 11, Paul commands the women when they pray and prophesy to wear a veil. Now, I'm not going to talk about that here. That's not my business. I'm serious. Even if that's something for our culture, we're not ready for it. We're, we're still too youthful for that. I'm not saying it is or it isn't. I'm not saying either one. But I'll tell you this. It is a symbol of her authority. It's a symbol of her authority that she is submitted to the man. The veil of the church is the Spirit. And when we are not operating in the gifts, we are undignified in the sight of God. We are not wearing the clothing that makes us pure. Only when we have the veil of the Spirit, only when we're soaked in power and operating with a quick word, operating with healing by power, raising the dead, preaching in transformational power. Only then are we clothed with the beautiful veil that attracts the Master. That's the only time. You show me a dry, dead church, maybe there's potential there. But if it has determined not to operate in raw power, but to operate with the arm of the flesh, I'm talking about putting on every different kind of program, which there's no problem with programs if they're growing out of the birth. But I'm talking about substitution. I'm talking about being sensitive to the seeker so we don't offend anybody. When we are not veiled or clothed with power to God, we are naked and we are not desirable. The beauty of the church is the clothing of the Spirit. Make no doubt about it, friend. The church is only beautiful when she's clothed in the Spirit. Some people say about that, well, what about love? What about the practical needs that people have in giving a cup of cold water and visiting the prisoner, which Jesus himself taught us in Matthew 25? All these things are a part of the gospel. They are a part of the church's ministry, but never meant to be a substitute for power. What about love? In 1 Corinthians 13, Paul taught us about love so that we have the proper wineskin to handle and distribute the power. Not in place of the power. Let me give you this before I close this point. If we really love the people we're ministering to, we'd meet their real needs. 
and their real needs are supernatural. If we really love people, we'd pay the price to meet them where they really need it. And they need a transformational gospel. And they need their AIDS healed. And they need to be delivered from homosexuality. They need to be cleansed of leprosy. And friend, an arm around the shoulder is not going to accomplish that. One man that was brought forth in a Smith Wigglesworth meeting, he had cancer in his belly and Brother Smith comes up to him, asks his friend, they brought him, he's still in his hospital gown, he's got cancer. He said, what's wrong with him? They said, he has cancer. He said, where is it? They said, it's in his stomach. So Smith, of course, as you all would, wound up and punched him right in the gut. The way it was described by one of the men who was mentored by him, he says he wound up. Pop. Not very compassionate. What would we do? Well, we'd put our hands on him and pray. And I'm not saying, I'm not trying to develop a new ministry of punching people. Some of you would like that ministry. <laughs> if you're led of the Spirit, you got the wisdom and the liberty of God, go for it, but you better have that. And you probably better have the blessing of the head of the house where you're visiting. But it didn't look very compassionate. You know, it looked gruff. We would have been a little bit more sympathetic. We would have let a little tears trickle on his face, you know. I mean, Smith hit him and he died. They said, you killed him. And he just kept praying in the prayer line. He says, you kill him. He says, he's not dead, he's healed. Kept praying. Sure enough, the guy got up, not only not dead, but healed of his cancer, running around in that little hospital robe. Smith didn't seem to engage real human compassion, but he did. He loved that man enough to heal the cancer. Not just make him feel good or give him a little glimmer of hope. Friends, that's our call in the world. To be clothed with the veil that identifies us with the head. That is true love. Willing to pay the price to meet real needs. The real needs of people are sin, disease, hopelessness, and only the power of heaven is sufficient to touch them and kiss them the way love wants to touch them. Friends, do we really love people? Do we really have compassion? Power goes with compassion, and compassion goes with power. Let us be clothed with the veil that identifies us with Jesus Christ. We must not only have the mentality of a bride who's clothed with the humility and the compassion and the power of her husband, but we must also be clothed with armor having the mentality of a soldier. If we are not wearing the full armor of God according to Ephesians chapter 6, we are vulnerable to satanic attack and are ineffective to minister the way Jesus wants us to minister. I mean, think about this. The first thing Paul says in Ephesians 6, starting with verse 10 and going down through, he says, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. The first thing he does is he gives us injunction like we're, like we're soldiers. You've got to be strong, man. If you're going to do this, you've got to be strong. Friend, if we're going to be clothed with power to do something about the things we prayed about on this platform, we've got to be strong. We've got to have the mentality of a soldier. We've got to be clothed in the armor of God. And probably right about now, Steve would have a Steve would have an illustration, but, but I, don't, I was just called for this job this morning. In fact, I'd like to tell you that story. Uh, I've been bombarded by the devil over this past Christmas break, like many of you have, like several of the leadership has. Things in the mind, I mean, when we were on our vacation, I was having things go through my head that I didn't even want to share with my family because, first of all, it was vacation and I didn't want to burden with it. Second of all, there were other things going on that they had to deal with, so... Just things going on in the head. Well, last night I was having these crazy dreams. They were just from the devil and all this terrible destruction. And uh, when I'd wake up out of it, I'd want to pray, but I was too physically weak from other things to do that. So, you know, I'm not whining. I'm not trying to speak those bad things. I'm just telling the story because it gets good, you know. It's okay. <laughs> New Year's... Uh, what was it? The New Year's Day, pastor said, I don't want to hear your bad stories because you've got to keep the tongue on the altar. But that's what, actually what I'm doing. You just let me go all the way with it. I'm very sensitive to those things. So, um, the last dream I had, I was at Brownsville, and oddly enough, I wasn't dressed right. 
had a t-shirt. You know the way these dreams are, you're not dressed right, but you have to go out. And I had a t-shirt, jeans, and bare feet. And I opened the door, I think it was up in the balcony, and looked out, and the place was just crowded. So I'm like, oh my goodness, what am I doing here, dressed like this? So uh, I said, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to run home and get my suit, because I think I had to sit on the platform for some reason. And I, said, I sent somebody in, I said, go tell them that I'll be there in a minute. I, had to, I, I, I came all the way here, but I had to run home and get something I forgot. So as I was shutting the door, everybody started getting my attention. No, come here, come here. Pastor just called you to preach. I had that dream night for you. I'm, like, I'm, like, I'm in a t-shirt, jeans, and bare feet. So I found some sneakers. I at least tried to put the sneakers on. I thought, well, maybe you, no one will see the ankles. I'll just run up there and preach like this. But I wasn't clothed properly to preach. He called on me last second, you know. Well, I wake up from that thing. I got out of it right then. I woke up. I had to get out of that one. I go get my email. Message on the email. Pastor wants you to preach tonight. <laughs> for no way. I was already ready, ready to tell Mike Brown, keep me off the preaching circuit for a while. I'm serious. I'm not ready. I've let the devil in, pound him with my head. I'm not talking about any sin or corruption, nothing like that. I just feel like somewhere I must have left the door open. I, I honestly felt that. I was so badly attacked over the break. So many stupid things going through my head. Now these dreams. I, I was, as I was getting ready before I got my email, I was thinking to myself, I've got to tell Dr. Brown, keep me out of preaching. I'm not ready. I'm down. I'm down, man. I'm down. I can't do it. Then I get the email, preach tonight. What am I going to do? So I said, well, I've got to pray about this. As soon as I pray, the Lord spoke to me and said, son, be strong. None of that stuff's from me. Shoot! I'll compromise the clothing of my power if I'm simply not strong. Sometimes that's the top of the mentality of the soldier. We just got to remember, man, be strong. Just, just be strong. I'm not even going to give you a better reason. The scripture says, be strong in the Lord. So I began to pace back and forth. I said, you know what? This is the Holy Spirit. Thank God for the Holy Spirit. And he's going to turn it against the devil tonight. Because in the dream, I wasn't clothed right. Right? See how that all works? But God spoke to me right after he said, you're preaching. He says, this is what you're preaching on. Clothed in power. So I said, well, I'm going to wear the new suit then. <laughs> new shirt, new tie, everything. Praise God, a gift from above. The works. I figure, why not? I'm preaching on clothed with power. I'm not showing up in no t-shirt and jeans. I'm going to turn this thing all the way around. I was ready by 4.30. All dressed, ready to go. None of, that, none of the dream. Friend, all the nightmares are lies from the pit of hell. I'm ready. I'm clothed. I got my good shoes on. That wasn't from God. That was from the devil. And when we don't have that tough mentality, where at least we're able to say, look, I was down, but I'm a military man. That's what Dr. Brown told me on the phone. Look, you're a warrior. That's usually his counsel. Look, you're a warrior. <laughs> Go on with it. That's not always his counsel, but in moments like that, it is. And he's right. That's the mentality we've got to have. See, we talk about, again, doctrine. Oh, I speak in tongues. I'll even prophesy. And I believe all the right things. So we have the Spirit in us, if you would. But we don't always have Him on us. We don't have the attitude, the persona of a man or a woman who trusts the Lord. Good night. He's real. I'll be strong. I'll just stand firm. Think about it. Clothed with armor. It's not just something you believe in. It's something you wear. The first thing, thank Jesus, I am preaching. We wear that old belt of truth. Man, the belt of truth keeps everything on. The belt of truth. We must wear an understanding of the Word. When we are deficient, in our search of the scriptures for the face of God, we are unclothed. Everything hinges in the armor on the truth. Sanctify them in your truth. Your word 
is truth. Joshua, as a soldier, was told to meditate in the law of God from Sinai, day and night. Why? So that he'll be careful to observe it. It would be in his mouth. Friend, we are deficient when we simply lack that quick revelation we get from our own time in the Word. There's no way to be clothed with the reality of power. If this stuff started to pour on us right now, and we didn't have the pins in place to know what's going on, we would take it in a completely wrong direction, having no idea where God wanted to send the, this power and this anointing. The church must be informed of the truth. And we must wear the breastplate of righteousness. You want to know why this revival preaches a red hot righteousness, a high standard? You think it's legalism? Friend, it's not legalism. Don't say it's legalism. That's a cop out. It's because you don't want to submit to God. There is a legalistic righteousness, but it's not born in fire. It's the real righteousness of God is a response to the fire. You can help, Paul says in Romans 6, but to be a slave to righteousness. Friends, the righteousness of God is not legalism. This is war, man. Righteousness is part of our clothing of power. My righteous one will live by his faith. It is a lifestyle. I understand that righteousness, first and foremost, is the beauty of heaven on the earth. It's our responsibility before God simply to honor Him, to serve Him. It's just the normal Christian life. Some, some of you young people, you think you should get a congratulations and a trophy when you turn away from the sin you're going to turn away from tonight. And indeed, there is great joy in heaven when you do turn from your sin. But there's another joy too. It's the joy of being clothed in power so that you can go touch other lives and not just get, get congratulated for your life now that you repented. You know, I've been in the youth ministry. I've had to deal with some of these things where the same person is struggling over and over and over. Finally, they seem to give it up at the altar. At least they confess the best they can and thank God for that fruit. And that must be where we start. But after a while, it's like, good night. Are we supposed to salute you? Because you finally turned from your drug problem? You finally gave up your sorcery? And now you're supposed to be the superstar? Friend, there are lost nations out there that need you. Righteousness is power. We're looking for a youth revolution that will be radical in righteousness. Why? Because it's the son of righteousness that will rise with healing in its wings. That's what we need. Where there's righteousness... There is power to heal. There's also the readiness of the gospel of peace. The church has been so sleepy, not realizing that when God calls on us in a moment, we need to move with it. It's not the gospel of peace that's the shoes. It's the readiness of the gospel of peace. Because you can preach the gospel your way in your time. You can have an outreach. I mean, God always wants us to evangelize. But you better be where God wants you. Because if you're where God doesn't want you, you're not going to bear fruit. You may be throwing pearls at swine. I mean, it's interesting to me in that dream. That's one thing I really needed to get. I'm, I, my shoes weren't on. And the first thing I said when I woke up, I don't want to preach, I don't want to preach, I don't want to preach. And that's the next thing came in my email. You need to preach. I almost wasn't ready. And God's will would not have been done tonight. Friend, part of your clothing is being ready, whether it's sharing the gospel at the grocery store or it's just being ready when the master comes to the tree. He better find fruit there for him to eat. Always be ready. I'm talking about sobriety in prayer, sensitive to what God is doing in the season around you, in your generation. If God calls on you, he says, now is the time. You change your plans for the next year. I want you to have jop, 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 these many prayer campaigns in cities. You need to be ready and be ready to go. If God calls on us and says, look, we're going to change everything, I want you to pull back your schedules and I want you to reach out from the school in, in America and perhaps other countries in, in a, under a different kind of ministry or a different kind of, uh, kind of outreach for those guys who travel, be ready to do so. Just be ready. I may develop you over the long haul and you'll have an idea of the vision, or I may surprise you to test you to see if you're ready. Because if you're not ready, you don't have your shoes on. And if your shoes aren't on, you can't operate in power. What does God want to do while I'm preaching? What does God want to do after? During the prayer time. 
friend, if my shoes are off when I get that email, somehow something's compromised. I'm not saying it depends on me. I, says, I say it depends on us. And if we're not ready, if one person with responsibility says, no, I can't go, man, you, it's, something's going to be compromised. Power is not going to be released. Because readiness is part of the clothing of power. Shoot! When you guys wanted to start the school, they, they, you, at first you were going to wait, but then you, you had this urgent, right? This urgent idea. No, it must start in January and spring. And I had the same thing. When you called on me, I'm like, look, give me one more semester at home. I need to close out this ministry. You know, that's our mentality. Well, I have to close this out, or let my kids finish the school year, or let me build up a little bit more of a nest egg, or at least give me a couple of months to find a place, which we, we didn't have time to do when we came. But that wasn't God's will. God wants to know, do those things really matter to you? Are you willing just to let go and move and trust me? Friend, if you're not, you're not ready. And you're missing the clothing of power. Those are the shoes so that when you get there, you can preach the gospel in the vicinity of the Spirit and create peace. Change the atmosphere of a city. And that's what we're going to do. Preach the whole armor. What comes next? Shield of faith. I think they're supposed to be hooked onto the belt. In fact, you've got to hold high that shield of faith. You know what part of your clothing and power is? Faith. You've got to lift up that shield. You know what faith is? Faith's an attitude, man. Smith, I know the Smith Wigglesworth thing comes into my mind. He says, I've seen people pray and fast and roll on the floor in intense prayer throughout the night. And there's nothing wrong with that. He says, but I've seen them do that and still not simply believe the Word of God. See, we need both. We don't just need the fervency. I'm going to cry. I'm going to spend all night in prayer. That's great. If God calls you to do it, do it. We want 24-7 at the church and the school. Go for it. But there comes a time where you simply trust God's going to show up. God's going to make good on His Word. It's an attitude. We get underneath things. We start to think in the mentality of the world and let our problems and the heaviness of our circumstances dictate the way we feel. Friend, forget that. We need an attitude that invites God. David's courage was not in thinking he could defeat Goliath. David's courage was found in that when he took the field, he really expected God to show up. That's it. He felt that when he took the field, he had an attitude, God's going to show up and going to take you out. The church needs an attitude overhaul. We need the expect... God is... It, it insults God for us to be functional atheists. We know our Bibles. We'll talk about it. We'll even pray right. But when we face something really in the way, suddenly, God's not real. He's a ghost. He's a cartoon. That's not faith, man. Faith has an attitude. I'm going to stand here, my ground, until my God shows up. And you tell the devil, you say, you say to the devil, you can say what you want. This is what God's word says. But your circumstances say thus and so. Let my circumstances... See, you've got to be stubborn. You've got to be like a good stubborn Jew. Because that's the way they're supposed to be. You can say what you want. You could take away my life. You could take away uh, every comfort I have. I am going to stand here until God shows up. That's faith. And you know what? When you have that attitude, you have power. What could possibly harm you with an attitude like that? What's going to happen in the end? God's, God's going to show up. And there's people here right now saying, I hope he shows up tonight at prayer time because I need it bad. God speaks to you and says, keep expecting, and I will. The helmet of salvation. Is that next? <laughs> okay, it'll work. The helmet of salvation. That's, I'm telling you, man. Oh, I'm saved. I have that, right? Friend, you might be saved, but you may not be wearing your salvation. Salvation is deliverance, and salvation is victory. Salvation walks around with an attitude that says, God's going to get me out of this, and God's going to get me out of this, because I'm a winner. I'm a victor. I wear the attitude of one who's saved all the time. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. When we meet some afflictions, the first thing we say is, oh boy, here we go. Friend, you're not just saved once. You could get saved every day. 
Not just from sin, but from the things that afflict you. Wear the attitude of victory, and you'll have power. There are some believers here. You need a major overhaul in your attitude and understanding, and this word is for you. Your attitude change could create a release of power in your life, could solve many of your problems. I'm not talking about things that you've created because of foolishness or because of sin, though God will help there if you repent. I'm talking about just your attitude. Look, pick it up a little bit. God's true. He's real. Wear the virtues of God on you. Don't just talk about it. Wear them. Have the attitude. Have the knowledge. And have the voice. Which is the sword of the Spirit. We're not just thinking about it. Or just having a good attitude. We are speaking that which is true according to the Word. And it's not just confessing any scripture. It's the sword of the Spirit. It's the Word the Spirit gives. That's what creates. Some of us just need to get in prayer until we get a word from God. Not just buying in the devil, not just studying, 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 but finding the quick word for you now. That's the sword of the Spirit. I could quote a scripture for you right now. I quote John 3.16. I quote from Malachi chapter 3. Whatever. But what does God want to say now? That's the power and that's the secret to prophecy. The world is about to see the power of the spoken word of the Lord. The world is about to see the manifestation of the power of the spoken word of the Lord. In Genesis chapter 1, God said, let there be light, and there was light. Right? But that's not all. The Spirit was hovering, and God said in the atmosphere of the Spirit, let there be light. The first sermon that a born-again believer preached... Peter, Pentecost, Acts chapter 2. What happened first, the sermon? No. Atmosphere. The Spirit came like wind, like fire, and then like rain, and filled them. And now that the Spirit is here, and this prophetic activity, and this power, Peter got up and said, Jesus the Nazarene, and preached Be saved from this perverse generation. And they were saved. Why hasn't our preaching saved and changed people? Because it wasn't the sword of the Spirit. It wasn't done in the atmosphere of glory. Maybe that atmosphere will be here tonight. Maybe it already is. Maybe this word was spoken for you. And it's not just a sermon. Maybe there's somebody in the balcony who needed this word really bad. Friend, guess what? It's the sword of the Spirit. It's going to do surgery on you. It's going to change your life. It's going to awaken you to things that you should have known but didn't, but it's going to create because that's what the spoken word does in time. It creates in Jesus' name. That's the clothing of armor. That's the mentality of a soldier. There's one more piece that clothes us in power. It's the cross. Would you turn with me in your Bibles if you still have them handy? To Luke chapter 9. Oh man, oh man. Many people get heart problems because plaque accumulates in their important arteries or veins. The flow of the life-giving blood is there, but if there's foreign junk in the way, the flow can be inhibited and maybe even blocked. But the less plaque, the better flow. The less of the world we have caked in our hearts, the more flow you're going to see and experience. The secret to power is not a secret. It's the cross. The cross is what breaks us to the world and gives us more openness to be floodgates of power. All the way to verse 28. Let's just look at this part for now. This is the transfiguration. In verse 28, it says, Some eight days after these sayings, Well, we're going to read what those sayings are in a minute. 
he took along Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face became different. And his clothing became white and gleaming. And behold, two men were talking with him, and they were Moses and Elijah. Pretty interesting little devotions Jesus had, wouldn't you say? Who, appearing in glory... I wonder what, I wonder what happened other times when he prayed. They were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Clothed with power by being clothed with the cross. Well, this is a revelation. Jesus is the mighty, awesome, royal Prince of Heaven. The Son of God. I wouldn't argue that. But I will tell you that there is transforming power in the presence of the Spirit. And that what happened on the top of this mountain was a revelation of the power that resided in Jesus by the Spirit. This was a revelation of a man with the Spirit. That's what that was. So there are saints who have touched some of these nerves at times. And there have things, been things that have happened in their prayer time. I know few people who can change the atmosphere of a room simply by walking in. Thank God I do know a few. And it's probably because I don't get out enough. But I met one man who could change the atmosphere of a room just when he opened up his mouth because he did not speak except that which he was given by God. These people do exist, and they're different. They're different. And I want to be like them. I don't want to fake it, but I want to be like them. I had the privilege of meeting him and speaking with him days before he died. And it was in Wales. I was on a missions trip. I had no, man this, no, no idea this man even existed. And the pastor there who was... Uh, our friend, and we were working with him, he came to me one day and said, come on, we're going to go somewhere. I want you to meet somebody. I said, all right. And I come in, and here's this older man laying on a couch in this nice little room. And he said, oh, nice, you know, nice to meet you. I appreciate what's going on down there. He mentioned you by name. He thanked God for your work, Pastor. And then he turned away from me. And then he turned back to me. And his face and he opened up his mouth. Whew. Man, I'll tell you what. Whew. Heaven came in that room. I felt heat pouring on my face. Man, I'm not kidding, Bert. It went in my ears. My ears were burning like fire. Because his heart was slain to the things of this life. They were broken. He was broken to the things of this life. And his word came from his belly, which was transformed by the heart of God. He just opened his mouth. He said, a long time ago. Shoo! And off we went for like 45 minutes. Ah! I mean, to this day, the entire conversation is like, seared on my heart. Just started speaking. You know, Moses, whatever. You know, Joshua. Uh, uh, Moses and Joshua were the main things he spoke about. Let him just pour out when he was done. He just closed his mouth. You ever seen that happen? I'm telling you, he was broken. He didn't care if he had to speak all the time. He spoke when he had a word. And he shut up when he didn't. He said, well, that's not practical. It seemed to work for him. And they explained to me the sacrifice that his life characterized. He sacrificed things that he knew he could have had, but God did not call him to those things. He lived a, sa he lived a sacrificed life. He lived dead to the things of this world and, and awakened to the things of God and he spoke what the Lord gave him. And I tell you, this nation is going to hear some of his words that came from God. He changed the atmosphere when his face changed because the Spirit is proximate to death. Jesus' face changed. Even his clothes, his clothes gleamed. His clothing. His clothing got power. Oh, come on, that's weird. I know it's weird, but it's true. 
The Spirit of God was proximate to Jesus. You may have it in the atmosphere, you may have a great breakthrough, but there are some people, they're already broken through. And the Spirit just come. I mean, in His clothes! The Spirit bled through the cells of His face, bled into His clothing, and welcomed heaven into His presence. Do you remember reading? They touched the hem of His garment. Shoo! Power would come. It says that twice in Luke, chapter 6, chapter 8. And in chapter 5, the power was near to heal. Why? Because there was a broken man in the midst, wearing his cross, clothed with power. You get one, then you get the other. Praise the name of Jesus. The word of the cross. Power. In the Old Testament it says, uh, you know, if you get that garment with that mildew in it, get it out. And if it don't get out, trash the garment. You know, even the clothing can be clean and pure. If it's near the man who's broken, it can carry a little stuff. Say, man, that's odd. Didn't they used to take handkerchiefs off Paul's person? And they give them to a person with a demon? Out it came. Friend, this is the spirit's world we're talking about. Not the carnal world. You know why it came off Paul? Because he had the ministry of hankies. Give him a dime, he gives you... Because he was broken. And if you took something off his person, you're taking something that had some of the spirit on it. The substance, the life that the demons are afraid of. His clothes gleamed. What was the point? How did he light up like that? Well, back up to the sayings, friends. In verse 23, just a few verses before the transfiguration. If any man wishes to come after me, he must deny himself. And take up his cross and follow me. Boy, I'll tell you, you got to watch reading the Bible in context. You want transfiguration glory, you're going to have to put your tongue and your mind and your whole life on the altar. Man, and God's been showing me that in no uncertain terms. He said, son, you're going to have trouble crucifying yourself. But I'm going to send people to help you. There are people out there. There's a God in heaven. If you allow me to speak it this way, for lack of better term. There's a God in heaven and there's people all around us, whether in our church or in the nations, who need us. And if we live for Him and them, there's not much left for ourselves. And that is the cross. Because I'd go off and travel, and I'd be burdened in prayer, and I'd be weeping before the Lord and say, God, I'm failing as a husband and a father. And the Lord said, you are carrying a cross. Then I said, well, good, then I hope there's power coming from this. Because this hurts. This thing came this morning, and not the best physically, but the Lord said to me, they called on you because they need you. However it works out, they need you. And that's not a pride thing. Believe me, it's not a pride thing. You need to think this way with purity. Those people need you. When you get there, if you go by my need and your need, I'll send the power. And I said, well, if you gave a word about power, the Lord, perhaps I should also welcome and expect power to drop in this house tonight. In Jesus' name. So I call you to the cross tonight. You want to be clothed with power? You've got to be clothed with blood. You got to be clothed with the cross. You want power? Then repent deeper. Repentance is not just for the sinner, the repentance is for the saint. Every morning, every day, every night. Friend, I repent every day because I don't only turn away from sin, I turn to the Lord. Some of us have difficulty turning away from things that burden us. Because we don't think about the one to whom we are turning. And the promise that is in his hand. Repentance is the foundation of the kingdom. Repentance is a joy. Repentance is power. Repentance is the only action of the heart that recognizes the majesty of God. So I call you to repent today. We're going to repent on every level possible. And I'm not talking about making things up. I'm talking about the Spirit speaking to you and saying this and that. Turn away, turn to me, and release more power. And when I can practice the church in repentance, 
shall be clothed in power. Preaching the cross is not just talking about Jesus dying on it. It's talking about us dying on it. That's preaching the cross. That's why Paul said, I preach the cross and there's power. I determine to know nothing except Jesus Christ and this one crucified. And then demonstration of power. It's not just telling the story. It's telling the story and say, okay, now, your turn up on the cross. Die to this world because when the plaque of this world is gone, the flow will be steady. That's the preaching of the cross. We have ministries who will talk about the cross, but they won't call people to it. Well, there'll be no power there. Repent deeper, friends. The first level is always sin. There could be people here who feel you're completely outside what I'm saying because you're not a part of the body of believers. You may even admit yourself, I'm a raw pagan heathen or I'm terribly backslid. Well, guess what? God is pointing a holy gun of love at you and saying, if you'll just listen and respond to this message, I'll clean you in a heartbeat. You must repent from sin. It's that simple. Where you have been transgressing the laws of God, turn away. Church, the secret to power is repentance because it's the cross. Let the Spirit of God identify right now in your heart where you have transgressed the laws of God and where you know that you know He would call you guilty on that thing. And turn away. There's no greater joy. There's no greater energy than repentance from sin. Where's your mouth been, young person? Have you cursed an elder or authority or teacher? What's your attitude been toward your parents? What have you been saying about your parents in private? Parents, what have you been saying about your kids? Dad... Are you more comfortable with the remote control than you are in leading your family in prayer? Where are we breaking the laws of God? Do we have a problem with what we're looking at on the internet, with our movies, our entertainment? Friends, some of these things, we're being entertained by things we should be preaching against. That is sin. Tonight, clean house. Why am I saying this? So you can have more power? Yes, but because the world needs us to be different. So turn away from sin. But you've got to take it deeper than sin. We're not little children. You don't repent from sin and then go about your happy way. Consider your ways. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways... Sometimes it's not even those isolated transgressions. Habits, yes, but transgressions. They're not as effective at stopping the anointing as what we do with our lives habitually. Friends, stop and think about it. What do you do with your life? What are the paths you're taking? You may be clean before God in one sense but be totally outside of His will because your habits are completely wrong or your whole life is just going down the wrong route. You might be running from a call. Friend, if it's not God's way, it's a wicked way. It's not, it's not kind of in between. What do you do with your spare time? It might be clean, but does it benefit the kingdom? I'm not talking about foregoing honest and legitimate rest. I'm talking about wasting God's precious time, one of the few commodities we have. What are your ways? You ever been driving down the road and just go daydreaming and you get from one spot to another and you're like, man, how did I get here? I forgot like that whole span of three blocks. I hope I didn't hit anybody. Sometimes that's the way we live life. We just meander through just because we plug in devotions, go to church, and live cleanly by man's standards, but not wholly following God. Friend, you might have a streak in you of something you do. It might be a sports idol. Well, i got to have my sports. I mean, turn it on at the same time every night. And I'm... Well, that may be a way that's simply not God's way. And that's going to be hard for many of you in here to handle. But it's still true. What are your ways? Friend, this is big time repentance now. There's some of you in here, you, you, in your heart, you feel clean before God. But there are some ways that are totally unacceptable to God. You will bow before an idol habitually and you don't even realize it. But the Spirit of God is pointing it out right now. What about another level? Man, oh man, if we don't turn from religion, we are dead in the water. Consider why you go to church on Sundays and Wednesdays. And if it is not for the very reason, Dr. Brown, that you proclaimed at the beginning of this service to have a confrontation with the living God, you've taken away the dynamic, you've taken away the relational, you are in religion. This is not magic. It is the gift of God and it's hard work. 
And if your concern and my concern is not to worship God, meet Him, get a word for Him, and share His love, His gospel with other people, we have the wrong motivation. Religion is not the icing on, on the cake for a nice American life or whatever other nation you're seeking comfort in. We must turn away from religion. Any routine that has to do with God that does not come out of a dynamic, loving relationship. The clothing and power is not going to robe religion. And finally, and this is really apropos, this is really appropriate in the year 2000. Friend, we've got to turn away from self-preservation. I'm not talking about doing something sensible as a steward if God told you to get some water for Y2K. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the attitude underneath it. Where we don't really trust God. We're more concerned about our souls in this life. What do they think about me when I sing? Or what would my deacons say if I turned this thing toward revival and called for prayer instead of just a service every time, preaching? What if I extend the, the services, allow the Spirit to take over? Pastors, ch- Christian leaders, I hope you're listening. What will my people think? Friend, if you care about what people think, your soul is dear to you. You're trying to preserve something that doesn't belong to you. Let it go. What will they think of me if I, what will my wife think if, if I start to lead her in prayer and take spiritual initiative in the home? That's kind of embarrassing because it hasn't been my character. Guess what, friend? We need the mentality of a corpse. A dead man doesn't care. When we are concerned about preserving our souls in this life, there's no way the power can be released. But when we let it go, I mean almost recklessly, just let it go. The reputation, the financial security, woo woo The house, the car, if God calls. The sports team. The things that give us comfort in this life, that cause us to preserve ourselves, when those things are gone, that's... When the power is limitless, that's when it's limitless. That's when it happens. That's when it happens. You know what? When Jesus said, uh uh-uh, what's easier? To say your sins are forgiven? Or to say rise up and walk? He introduced this. His goal was not to get his face on a Christian magazine. He didn't care whether or not people had the right opinion about him. In a sense, hear me out, he didn't care whether or not he was going to fail. He wasn't going to fail, nor would he ever fail. But why is it when we're in that situation, I'd be afraid of failing. Now, I'm not saying you just go do this, but I am saying, if it were me, I'd think, what if this didn't work? Jesus Christ didn't have that thought. He didn't preserve his soul in this life. Therefore, when he called him up, it worked. How do you think Peter walked on the water, friends? Come on, guys. You want to be clothed in power? This is how. Peter didn't care about his soul on the water for those moments. Oh, it's because he had his eyes on Jesus and then he got his eyes on the waves. That's part of it. What was going on deep is that for those moments, he was blind to his safety. He didn't exist. Only that marvel walking on the water. And he said, power. But as soon as his soul became dear to him, he lost it. He began to sink. Isn't that something? Oh, yes, it has to do with where his eyes were, but there's something deeper than that. It's because he sought to preserve his soul. The danger of his body, the opinion of his peers, the security of his finances, suddenly they became an issue. As soon as they become an issue, he sinks. When they weren't an issue, and he didn't care about them, that's when he's walking on the water anyway. It's a paradox. Whoever would save his life would lose it. But whoever would lose his life for my sake will save it. Self-preservation will block the anointing. But wearing the cross will let it flow. Would you all stand with me, please?
This is all I'm going to say, friends, right now. Everybody stand with me, please, as you get yourself ready. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, by the power of the Holy Spirit, if you'll be honest before God and say that this message touched a place in my heart where I need to turn and I need to pray through because A, I want the power and B, because I'm under conviction. Right now, the Spirit is calling you to this altar to come and pray and seek God's face. You come right now if this spoke to you. Let the sword of the Lord open your heart. Be real and be practical. It might be a relationship. It might be an ugly sin. It might be a place of self-preservation where you're simply dictated by what other people think. You be as real, as practical, as down and dirty in your heart as you need to be and let it all come out. Just deal with it before God. I can see God pinpointing things in people's hearts right now. Wherever there's room, let them come. That's it, guys. Good for you. Good for you. Determine at this altar, with God's help, I will turn. Shoo! That's powerful. Praise God. Purishi. Coming down from the balcony, God bless you guys. You got courage. Let the word of the Lord be released in this place. Let the power of the Spirit be released and penetrate these hearts. Dear, dear children, getting right with God. Precious saints already fervent, going deeper. Praise the Lord. We're just going to pray. The cross. Take your time, folks. And I saw the face of mercy in that place of love. You opened up my eyes to believe your sweet salvation where I've been so blind.